Okay, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. It is now 12.04 on, on my clock here, and I really want to welcome everybody to the Lehigh Valley Reads Experience 2024. My name is Jill Pereira. I currently serve as the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships with United Way of the Greater Lehigh Valley, and I'm thrilled that we are able to convene folks today around a topic that is uh, pressing in our community and, and also nationally. Um, so I want to thank Crayola for their sponsorship of this Lehigh Valley Reads experience and all of the support that they've given us uh, with Lehigh Valley Reads as we move this work forward, as well as with our community schools that we will be lifting up today through this presentation around chronic absenteeism. Um, I'm going to keep it short. I want to encourage you to be typing questions into the chat. Uh, we have an action-packed 90 minutes. We will be hearing from a national expert on chronic absenteeism. We'll be hearing from our incoming CEO at United Way. We'll be hearing from some community leaders and the leader of our community school network. And then we'll be turning it over to questions and answers and have some facilitated uh, dialogue around strategies to, to effectively address chronic absenteeism. So I want to uh, turn it over now to Cecilia Leong um, from Attendance Works. Cecilia is the Vice President of Programs at Attendance Works, and since joining Attendance Works in 2011, she's helped expand the technical assistance resources available to communities across the country. In addition to providing high quality professional development through webinars and online learning, Cecilia works closely with the Attendance Works team to identify emerging technical assistance needs in reducing chronic absence and creating innovative tools to address those needs. Prior to joining Attendance Works, Cecilia worked for a variety of organizations that focus on district and school reform initiatives, such as Pivot Learning Partners and Berkeley Policy Associates. Cecilia has an AB from Harvard University and a master's degree in public policy from the University of California, Berkeley. So I'm going to turn it over to Cecilia Leong. Thank you so much, Jill. It's such a pleasure to be here with you uh, today. And I appreciate um, the uh, United Way of Greater Lehigh Valley and Crayola for making this uh, meeting possible. So today my presentation is called All Hands on Deck and how we improve attendance as an essential first step to student engagement. So I want to start out and tell you I come bearing good news and bad news. The good news is chronic absence is a solvable problem. And you're going to hear later from um, practitioners who are actually making that happen. The bad news is there's no magic bullet. There's no magic flyer, no magic one thing. It's a lot of teamwork and effort that together brings about the results that we want. So that's the good and bad news. And my goal today in this beginning part is to offer you some national context and some resources that you can take um, and apply towards your efforts. All right, next slide, please. So the first piece I want to share is that improving attendance mattered before the pandemic and still matters today. We know that when students attend school, they get great results all the way through. But I also want to point out that when students do not attend school, beginning as early as pre-K, we start seeing uh, very negative consequences. And I know you know this because with the focus on uh, third grade reading um, that has been led through Lehigh Valley Reads, you know the consequences that when students are missing, um, uh, chronically absent in early grades, that leads to inability to read at grade level by third grade, lower achievement in middle school, and a greater likelihood of dropout in high school. And those are just the academic consequences. We've seen also the effect on uh, students' social emotional development and other health outcomes as well. Next. So I'm using the term chronic absence. I'm suspecting most of you are very familiar with it, but just to be absolutely clear, we're talking about missing 10% or more of school for any reason. And this includes excused, unexcused, and days missed due to suspensions. It's really critical to think about this measure as um, missing opportunities to learn. 
It's not truancy, which is about unexcused absence and not complying with um, compulsory ed. And it's not average daily attendance, which is also important, but which hides uh, which students are missing too much school and is putting them behind. Next slide. So here's uh, side by side the three definitions that I talked about. ADA can be really helpful. It's a school level measure. You can really look at it and anticipate, for instance, when dips in attendance occur. And you can use that as a way to strategize to counter that, but it masks individual student chronic absence. Truancy uh, counts only unexcused. It tends to emphasize compliance. It's what most of us grew up with, right? And usually that leads to more legal or blaming or punitive solutions. And chronic absence, as I said, really emphasizes the impact of missed days and the benefits of being present in school. Um, most of what I will talk about is about prevention, problem solving, taking a trauma sensitive approach uh, that cultivates family and student engagement. So this is the contrast between the measures. Next slide. So just to give you an example, I always like to give examples from other states so you don't feel pinned down, um, but average to daily attendance really can mask chronic absence. We're so used to thinking 90% or 95% is an A, but when it comes to attendance, it is not. So these are schools in Louisiana, um, the ones on the left with 95% ADA, the ones on the right with 90%. And you can see despite having those high levels of ADA, how high chronic absence levels can spike, right? So on the right, for example, school A, 32, 33% chronic absence, a third of their kids. And if they didn't look at that measure, they'd think they were fine at 90% ADA, mm -hmm. right? So these are things we need to watch out for. Next slide. So we've seen a national crisis in chronic absenteeism. Um, you can see from 17, 18, we thought we had a problem with 16% of students chronically absent. That was 8 million kids. I look back fondly at those days now because we are at 30%, almost 30% nationwide or 14.6 million kids. And the floodwaters have not receded. When we look at 22-23 data from states that have reported it, the rates still remain high. The good news is there have been some reductions in some states, but nowhere near back to pre-pandemic levels. Next slide. So who are our chronically absent students? We took the federal 21-22 data apart, um, and we really see that chronic absence um, is represented in all student groups, with the largest one being white students at 36%, um, Latino 35, and Black students 20%. So every student group is represented here. Next. We also see that in that 30% chronic absence that some student groups are disproportionately represented. So these are the kids that we worried about before the pandemic, and many of them, many of the groups have fallen even farther behind. So you see the disproportionality for Pacific Islanders, Hispanic, Black, Native. Um, and these are of great concern to, to us who want all our children to achieve, and we're seeing the gaps widening. Next slide. So we created, with the help of Johns Hopkins, an interactive map using that 21-22 data. And rather than listening to me talk about it, um, because everything is always local and personal, right? Next slide. We are going to give you a chance to take a look and see how your data compares to uh, surrounding um, districts in Pennsylvania. And if you really want, you can compare nationwide. So. Um, Maddie's going to drop a link to the map, and when you get the map on the left-hand side under Map Controls, you want to click and select Pennsylvania. And then you can hover over wherever your district is and take a look. 
Now, if you're not from Pennsylvania, feel free to select any other place, but I'd be curious uh, what you notice when you look at your own data. So as you take a look at your data, why don't you give me a one word reaction in chat? Were you surprised, shocked, pleasantly surprised? That's two words, I'll, I'll allow it. Bill, did you look yours up? Yeah, before you ask for the one word, what came out of my mouth was wow. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other reactions? Okay. Um, so for a fun party game, let's bring back up the slides. You can also look up um, where you went to high school. And um, yes, it is astonishing. I think the first time I saw the data, I just about cried. So I want to continue though. It's not just that 30%, just 30% are chronically absent. But when we look at chronic absence by school levels, right? we are seeing that some schools have more than 20% of their students chronically absent, right? And some have even more. And what does this mean? It means that of all the students in the US, two thirds, 66% attend a school with that level or higher of chronic absence. And when you get to that level, it's not just the student who's chronically absent who's affected. I have some principals and superintendents in the audience, and I'm sure they can tell you that when you have that level of absence, it ripples out. Everywhere in the classroom, if you're a teacher and students are coming in and out, how are you managing to pace your instruction and differentiate when it's a different child every time? What happens to the school climate when there's so much disruption and in and out and that sense of connection and identity? And when you think about the larger community, what effects are you seeing there um, as youth are not in school um, regularly? So there are ripple effects and it's a much bigger consequence um, than just for the individual students. Next slide. So we know from the research, chronic absence is especially challenging for low income students. Poor kids are more likely to be chronically absent um, than their higher income peers, although some of those shifts are starting to happen, which are very odd for higher income students as well. But ch children in poverty are more likely to lack basics, whether it's health, safety supports, clothing, foods, um, that makes it easier for a child to get to school. And I think what most of us in this room care about is the impact on literacy development, that it's harder for a child in, uh, from a low-income household to catch up if they miss a lot of school. Next slide. All right, so chronic absence really contributes to that literacy gap. This is a study that came out of uh, Harvard from Professor Kim um, that has been widely shared in the campaign for grade level reading. And what you really see is that the literacy gap begins in kindergarten and grows, and we never close it if we don't get it right at the beginning. Next slide. And we know from research in Rhode Island, when they took a look at all the students in kindergarten who were chronically absent, the effect of that absence lingered well beyond first grade. We saw, they saw lower levels of literacy in first grade and lower achievement as far out as fifth grade. 
So students who are scoring lower in reading and math, more likely to be retained and more likely to be suspended. Next slide. So how can we address chronic absence? I don't mean to come in here and depress all of you um, with the uh, statistics and research, um, but really focus on solutions. Next slide. So one of the things that is, has really been a lesson to us as we've worked with schools and districts over the years is that the pathway for change doesn't start out with strategy. It doesn't start out with goals. It starts out actually addressing the mindsets that we have about families, about students, and about attendance. Um, then in order to shift the mindset and take action, we need the right data, meaning chronic absence data, as well as data about what's happening with students and families. We need to know what to do with it. Our staff needs to know what their responsibility and how to respond and act. And we need evidence-based strategies, some of which we will share with you today. Next. I want to give you an example of what I mean by mindset. One of the key things is changing that power dynamic with students and families. Um, typically, we see a lot of schools unintentionally sometimes focusing on problems rather than partnership. So approaching a family only to address a problem. That was kind of my mother's style of parenting. You know, just be perfect. I'll come talk to you uh, if there's a problem. Well, that doesn't really build a relationship, um, but it just makes you hide, honestly. And we sometimes do rely on one-way messaging. We talk at families rather than listening to them and talking and dialoguing with them. We unintentionally focus only on barriers rather than looking for strengths that, that we can leverage. And we think we know all the answers, right? It's, it's probably bad for my head to be identified as a national expert. It makes me think I'm smart and know everything. Well, I know some things and I'm happy to share them, but let's be honest. Other people know a lot as well. And do we have that attitude when we're working with families? So mindset is critical. Next. And prevention and early intervention are key. Many of you are familiar with tiered systems of support. Um, as educators, you know, the best thing is to have good instruction at the base. And then the interventions happen when that isn't sufficient, right? And so for attendance, it's the same thing. It's having universal tier one interventions that set expectations for coming to school. And then we identify the students who are missing 10% and add some early intervention. And if needed, we have intensive interventions at tier three. You'll notice that the tiered framework sits on top of foundational supports that promote positive conditions for learning. Next slide. And we added this because we never had to explicitly name these things pre-COVID, but we saw all these things falling apart um, in the last few years that students do come to school and are engaged when schools are physically and emotionally healthy and safe. And we began questioning all of that. Now, can I touch the surface? Can I hug somebody? Should I wear a mask? What is going on? And students come when they feel a sense of belonging, connection, and support. Um, that also uh, is something that we have to actively rebuild. Um, they come when they're academically challenged and engaged, as well as supported by adults who have the well being and emotional competence to create those relationships that are at the very center of this piece. Okay, next. I want to stress four key strategies um, that we think has a profound impact on improving attendance. The first is family engagement. And for those of you in elementary, you know that's key because who brings the child to school? But it's also important in the older grades as well. 
um, do not dismiss the impact of parental support and involvement. Um, the second one is student connectedness. And there are so many strategies that really make a difference in building a sense of belonging um, in a school. The third is health and safety. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that as we go on. And the final piece are community partnerships because it can't be schools alone. And I know that's why you have a community school strategy. Okay, next. All right, I want to make sure you have access to the attendance playbook. Um, some of you may uh, already have it and have memorized, highlighted, dog-eared, and done everything with it, and some may not. This is a piece that we created with Future Ed to summarize the latest research on what improves attendance um, and reduces chronic absence. This is the third edition, and I urge you to download it and the implementation guide, because unlike ordering from um, a restaurant menu, it's not pick one of each from each tier. It's really thinking through carefully, what do my students need? What barriers do we have to remove in order to select the right interventions? Next. Okay. Um, I think it's really key that we take a team approach. So practically speaking, if you have 200 students who are chronically absent in your school building, or even 100, you are not going to be able to case manage your way out with one staff person. You need a team. Next slide. And that team's job is not to case manage their way out of the problem, but to organize and facilitate a school-wide strategy to improve attendance. So everybody has a role and knows to do their part. Next. So we're gonna run through the functions of the school team and I teach a whole course on this, um, but today I just want you to be aware. First, um, and just click through for me, Maddie, thank you. That team has to organize the strategy and move towards prevention and early intervention. Second, the team um, really has to look at their data, not just the chronic absence data, they're looking for bright spots and they're looking for groups to support, but they're looking at their qualitative data. What are they hearing from students about what gets them excited about coming to school or why they can't wake up in the morning because they were up playing you know, on their video games all night, right? So you have to look at your data. Third, um, you need to identify some of those assets as well as barriers that affect attendance. Fourth, it's making sure everybody in the school building and in the larger community addresses attendance. One of the most powerful things I've seen in communities, whether they're rural, suburban, or urban, is when the teachers get on board and they do their part um, by making calls, recognizing when a student's been absent. That is when you have the whole school systematically working together, and that makes a huge difference. And finally, fifth, um, you regularly determine if you're making a difference and abandon the things that don't work and um, amplify the ones that do. Next. So the team really has to have leadership, whether it's the school principal, assistant principal, as well as people with expertise, right? School nurses have been such heroes in the work um, when parents are wondering, when do I send my child to school? The, the guidance keeps changing. Stay home if you have a sniffle. Don't stay home if you have a sniffle. What are you supposed to do? And the school nurse is a trusted person who can answer those questions. So take a look at this and make sure that your team is more than me, myself, and I. <laughs> so that's not going to work. Okay, next. I think we're going to skip the video. You will get the slides um, and you're gonna hear more about your local community school strategy um, because I want to have you have time to explore um, some of the resources that uh, we have for you today. Next. And just to say and reinforce that community schools are a wonderful strategy 
for improving attendance and many other student outcomes. And some of you may have seen the RAND study um, summarizing the impact of New York City's community schools work. Really impressive results. Um, students more likely to graduate on time, missing fewer days of school, I think almost a month, better attendance, better math scores, and students feeling safer and more supported. So it's a fantastic uh, evaluation and endorsement of community schools. Next. So in, if you're one of the uh, schools working on a community school strategy, I really urge you to look at chronic absence um, as one of your key data points. It's a unifying common goal. It's effective for knowing where to allocate your staff and resources, right? Which groups have high rates? Where do you want to put your foot down? And it's an easy to understand measure of progress and success, right? Okay, so next, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. I suspect I am. So earlier I had talked about, um, you know, understanding the reasons for absence and community schools really help address some of those challenges, removing those barriers. Um, I was excited to hear um, Principal Bodnar sharing about the vision program that she's going to talk about. Um, whether it's barriers, aversion, disengagement, or correcting misconceptions, these are all pieces that um, we need to peel away so that students uh, have an unimpeded road back to school. Next. So underneath all of this, the perspectives of students and families matter. I can give you a long lecture, but I can tell you a funny story too. Um, you know, students really know what works and what doesn't. Um, and one of my colleagues had a principal asking him, you know, what incentives should I offer my students? And my colleague said, I don't know. I'm not 16 years old. I'm a 49 year old man. What do I know about what a student wants and what would motivate them? So the principle is very simple, which is to ask. Ask and understand so that your solutions actually will work. Next. Okay, I want to end with um, some resources and actually a chance for you to actively um, do something. So we're going to do a treasure hunt right now. And Maddie's just dropped the Attendance Works uh, website into the chat. And I'm going to give you, let's see, I think I'm going to give you four minutes. Is that about right, Jill? Maybe four minutes and see if you can find these resources on the Attendance Works website. If you find them, they're yours. This is a scrappy uh, competitive bunch, Cecilia. So I suspect that your website right now is being crawled around on by lots and lots of folks looking for these resources. Excellent. Download away. And while you're looking, I will talk quietly. You can either mute me and look or you can listen a little bit if you want. So the handouts for families are really helpful um, and come in multiple languages. I really like the student attendance success plans and the help bank because it's asset-based. It asks families who already is in your orbit who can help you get your child to school. And I like using them as a tier one intervention. For example, hey, let's all work on this together as a school on back to school night. There's no stigma. There's nothing wrong with you. Everyone needs a plan B. So those are just a few of the pieces. And then a key messaging one is the showing up matters for real toolkit. So it takes attendance messaging beyond academics. It talks about many other things as well.
Okay, well, let us wrap up um, because I think there is a lot more planned for the day today. Um, let's go on, Maddie. So we did the 2122 National Analysis. If you're curious and want to read more about the reasoning and, and ideas behind the analysis, those are the three blogs that we published. And you can uh, find those on the website as well. Next. Is that my last slide? Yeah, okay. So you go back one. Um, we didn't create a slide, but the campaign for grade level reading has just uh, given us, um, given you actually the first piece of a Kindergarten Matters um, uh, piece that they've written and invited you to. So um, Maddie's going to drop that as well. And uh, I just want you to know, I went and asked them for it. It wasn't ready. And I said, but wait, I'm going to the Lehigh Valley tomorrow. You got to give it to me. So it's there for you. All right, so that's it. I'm gonna step back and I know we have questions and answers later. I'll try to answer some of the ones that are in the chat. Thank you, Jill. Great, Cecilia, thank you so much. That was a lot of information. I think, yes, speaking to the choir and also like a really good reframe for folks who have been working on chronic absence in their own way, kind of in their own area. Uh, we're really looking to have a unifying message here with LV Reads across the region around how do we address chronic absenteeism um, at a grander scale. And so all of that information and the peak at the resources and the nudge for folks to get onto the website and be utilizing that really, really super helpful. Appreciate the national context and, and your expertise. Um, and also the, the sneak peek that we'll have around the kindergarten, uh, kindergarten matters piece. Really appreciate you pushing that our way. I uh, want to share with folks that the chat, we unfortunately have the chat feature set so that y'all can't see the chat from each other. That's unfortunate. Uh, we can see it if you are chatting in to folks that are listed as hosts. So please do submit your questions. We can still see them. We will pull them back out in a Q&A session um, closer to the end of the presentation. I want to offer lots of thanks and kudos to you, Cecilia, and we're going to transition now. Um, I want to introduce Marcy Lesko. She is our incoming CEO for United Way of the Greater Lehigh Valley and has spent the better part of two decades in leadership here um, of our team and want to turn it over to you, Marcy. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, Cecilia, we can't thank you enough for spending some time with us today, sharing your expertise. And uh, I, I know the, uh, you know, your comment on being a national expert, but also telling a good story. Just really appreciate your humility of having so much um, breadth and depth of knowledge and sharing it with us in such a way that felt um, just really sincere. I just really appreciate um, your work and um, and what you've brought to us today. I was looking around the participant list um, and seeing faces of and names of old friends and partners that have been with us for a long time and also new faces and new friends and new partners. I'm looking over at Ms. Esther Lee, the NAACP in Bethlehem, who always figures out how to get it done, um, is sitting here with us. Melanie Sanchez Jones, who's a United Way board member, um, who always shows up and says, how can I help? I see our new friend, Dr. Robin Harris with the Allentown School District, who I had the good fortune of traveling with over the last few days. We arrived home at midnight last night from a trip together up to Hartford to see some of their community schools work up there, our friends in Panther Valley, Jose Delgado, and then all of our team members. I just, and of course, Jack Silva, who is a superintendent in Bethlehem that we just adore. So I'm looking across all of these faces and thinking about the richness of the work and the things that we have done together over the years, many of us. Some of you may not know that I began my work here at United Way in our community schools work. So I was hired in in 2006 to help lead and build this emerging uh, initiative called Community Schools. We had two schools, $100,000, and no idea if this thing would ever actually take off. And today we have 
33 schools in our community schools network. We're heading towards 45. Um, we have committed to that over um, by 2030. And after my conversation with our friends in Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton, and Panther Valley, it sounds like we're going to blow right by 45 pretty quickly. So um, there's a real uh, eagerness and desire to grow and scale to reach as many children as possible in uh, children and families in our, in, as possible in our communities. Something I, I want to say is that um, as I transition into this role as the CEO of an organization um, of a community that I adore and love so much, um, community schools have such a special place in my heart. And so it's been wonderful to revisit all of the, the good work that's happening through our team members and certainly seeing the work in action in the last few days. But anytime I get a chance to go into one of our schools and I see the things sort of working, you know, all the, the work happening together, it, it just um, reminds me of why we do what we do here. Here at United Way, we have committed 80% of all the dollars that we raise that are um, available to our discretion, 80% of those dollars go into our education work. And the reason that we care about that and the reason that that is important to us is that we believe an educated population is the cornerstone of our democracy. And that we also believe that education is one of the most powerful paths out of poverty. We believe that education is um, important in all of the ways. And we also further believe that it is not just the responsibility of educators in our schools, but it is the responsibility of our community. And so uh, many years ago, I never forget being at a, at a conference and someone who was leading youth development work on the West Coast stood up and grabbed the microphone and he said, for me and my work, my commitment to this work means I am willing to put my personal last name on the back of that student. I have to believe that we are committed to his success or her success as much as our own. And so we have uh, we have adopted that through the years and have kept that belief for almost now 20 years years. We have stayed the course with community schools. Next year, we will celebrate 20 years of this effort. And in fact, it has not slowed down. It has only grown, which has been um, a point of pride for us. We are starting to see some wonderful results. Um, and um, many of you know that, or some of you know that one of my favorite phrases is without the data, the chat and all matter. And so we have to be committed to delivering results um, because while there are many different programs and services and efforts that matter, um, at the end of the day, the question is always, what difference did it make? And so um, in many cases, um, we are, our United Way holds up the mirror and reflects back to all of you the work that you're doing in your school. And so we share and celebrate that success and we pour over the challenge is with you and say, what can we do better? How do we fix this? Where should we go? I will never forget in the early days at Roosevelt Elementary School um, in Allentown. And of course, Dr. Silva, I see your face. I have Bethlehem examples all over the place as well. But I'll tell you about Roosevelt Elementary School. I know I'm just teasing. Um, but I'll never forget at Roosevelt Elementary School, they were trying to figure out how to get parent engagement to be boosted up. And they could, they really had a challenge with this. We had a lot of families that had maybe had a negative experience themselves in school, or they had other things that uh, were preventing parent engagement. And that creative and innovative team of folks created a little stand with hot chocolate and coffee for parents in the morning as they were dropping off their kids. They set a table by the road. Now that seems like a great idea. Of course, everyone loves all of that. But what was creative about it is they put it by the, the street at the street level and then they slowly pulled it back towards the school and then inside the school door until they had more parents inside of the school almost 20 years ago as we were starting this work. And we have examples of those kinds of creative ideas all over the place. And then I will never forget it. a year or two later, they were regularly seeing four to 600 families coming out for 
their book blasts and their um, reading nights um, and other things. And so we know that these creative ideas, not only with our educators, but our community partners make a difference. Go ahead, Maddie. So as we're starting to see some uh, results, um, student attendance and chronic absenteeism is something we've been paying attention to for a long time. And so as part of our community schools effort and our initiative here, we lift up um, not only the data, but also we bring in experts like Cecilia and others so that we can learn together. We can be in constant learning community together on new ideas, best practices, and it sparks thinking on the things, the common problems that we're all trying to solve here. We know that um, student and family engagement almost always skyrockets when we do our uh, community schools work. Um, it matters um, because of that team, that concentrated effort. Um, and so when we see something like family engagement with 124% increase, we know that that matters. Um, family engagement is not just a nice to have, it is a need to have um, as we um, look at improving um, outcomes for children and families. Go ahead. While I'm moving fairly quickly through some of these results, um, these are the best results we have seen um, in our work for a long time. And um, we're heartened by it. It allows us to um, keep thinking about how we continue to grow. Um, when we say that nearly one in four students were identified as needing behavioral health supports, and when we see something like 81% of, of them were able to, to be served, or we were able to get them connected to resources, that matters. Um, we know that we are making an effort to connect kids and families to the resources that they need, which is one of the most powerful parts of what community schools do. Um, we look at, again, with food and health and other, other pieces. These are just a, this is just a slice and a snapshot of the kind of measures that we look at. Go ahead, Maddie. I think we're at the end of my piece. Yep. So what I want to say is that as we are looking then at student attendance, we have set a an aggressive community wide goal, um, which allows us to work with all of our education partners, not only in the five school districts that we currently work in, but across our region to lift up why uh, chronic absenteeism and school attendance matters. And so I want to thank you for joining us today, for continuing to be part of our effort here, and um, to our team who has done such a nice job organizing this webinar today. So back to you, Jill, um, and I'll let you go ahead and take it from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marcy. Lots of history there and bringing us right up through the present and all of it centered on partnership. So really appreciate you um, as you're stepping into this new leg of your role, continuing to lead the charge around community schools and, and all of the work we do in community. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Kushbu Jain, who is our, net, our United Way Community School Network Director for um, some comments and facilitation of a panel. Kushbu. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, Marcy and Cecilia, for speaking um, about the national context and some of our history in community schools work over the years. Um, I'm excited to get into conversation with our panel, and each of them has decades of experience and a long list of accolades that I could take the next 30 minutes <laughs> listing out but I wanna share their experience and work and energy with you guys. So for time's sake, I'll start introducing them um, shortly. So longtime friend of LV Reads and early adopter, Superintendent Jack Silva of Bethlehem Area School District um, is our first panelist today. We'll also be in conversation with Principal Rebecca Bodner of Central Elementary School, Valentown School District, and she's been the principal there for the past nine years. Um, I know she had a shout out earlier, so, so you'll definitely get to be in conversation with her. Um, Ms. Danielle Day, the Intervention Specialist as Ramos Elementary Element, uh, School in Allentown School District, which is also one of our newest community schools um, this past year. Um, and she is a proud product of the Allentown School District K-12 schooling system. So you'll get to hear a lot from her and she can tell you context and history of, of Allentown School District and how it's evolved over time too. And Principal John Couples, 
um, the principal of Paxinosa Elementary School in Easton Area School District. So those are our four panelists. And just to set the stage, I want to make sure to say we are hearing from representatives of three out of our five school districts that Marcy spoke to a little bit earlier today, um, but know that all of those outcomes and um, successes that Marcy was sharing um, are reflected in all five of those school districts and, and those best practices are shared across the network of our community schools. So I'll jump right in. Um, I guess my first question, starting with um, Dr. Jack Silva uh, of Bethlehem Area School District, can you speak to what's the goal of chronic absence um, for Bethlehem Area School District this year? And also give us a little history or context of like why and how this has changed in the past two to three years. Thank you, Kushbu. And also thank you to uh, Dr. Uh, Leong, uh, set the gold standard with uh, Attendance Works. We use your resources all the time, so thank you. And, and of course, to Jill and Marcy, thank you for organizing today. Um, as far as goals, the Bethlehem Area School District, anybody who uh, is involved with it has heard me say many times, You know, we have really basically four priorities and they all relate to improving student attendance. And that's to have a positive uh, school safety and positive school culture, improve attendance, grade level work for grade level kids and preparing college and career ready graduates. You can't do any one of those without successful uh, efforts to improve student attendance. So our, our, our challenge in Bethlehem is very similar to every challenge uh, in uh, urban schooling. Uh, I remember in the old days prior to the pandemic, attendance was still an issue. I remember take five from the uh, United Way's approach and how to uh, uh, deal with chronic absenteeism to limit the number of days a student missed to five or less. And then at, at that time, the Bethlehem area school district, we were below 20% re related to chronic absenteeism. But then the pandemic hit and it ballooned and it more than doubled. In 2021, we were up near 40%. And now we're back down under 30%, but that is still too high if you're going to achieve all of those priorities that I'm talking about. Uh, those priorities also inform student attendance and reducing chronic absenteeism. So uh, can I share my screen, uh, Kushbu? Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm Please more go ahead. I know you would rather uh, look at the uh, screen than you would me. So how's that? I can see your screen uh, and there are two. Very good. Two documents. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Maureen Leeson is on the uh, um, uh, Zoom with us and she is our chief academic officer. And we also have folks who work in our pupil services, our student services. Those two worlds can't be uh, dealing with attendance separately. They have to be dealing with attendance together because just as was mentioned in the presentation, that data-informed multi-tiered system has to be on both academics and on pupil services as it relates to student attendance. So there is an anxiety absenteeism cycle. You know, when students fall behind academically, they feel like they can't do the work, school and class becomes more successful. It increases the likelihood of them wanting to not be in school, and then it just keeps cycling uh, with additional failure. So one way, one approach, the academic approach in tier one is to prevent academic failure, uh, which has traditionally been the reason uh, for uh, high degrees of absenteeism. So it is important to do all that work on the student services side, no doubt about it, very important. But if less we are uh, breaking that anxiety absenteeism cycle that goes along with student success, uh, any gains are, are going to be more short lived. That doesn't mean that we haven't in the Bethlehem Area School District, and Kushbu, I think I'm answering your second question now because you gave it to me in advance, uh, of convening our uh, district attendance team. And that has been in our pupil services department with uh, uh, Claire Hogan and Tracy Herner. And they have convened a lot of the stakeholders, including the academic stakeholders, uh, into a, uh, a way of supporting uh, student attendance, that, that attendance goal for the district. And they have developed multi uh, uh, multi uh, approaches, informed approaches, but really three or five separate committees. 
We're looking at our district level systems. Uh, do we actually do things that increase student attendance or uh, increase student absence? Or, you know, if, if our traditional approaches towards reducing absenteeism was menacing calls to parents and threatening to sick the magistrate on them, that would have worked already. <laughs> so what are we doing? Like, what, what are our district systems in terms of how we uh, uh, collect them, how we set goals? Uh, I, I believe it's extremely important to collect average daily attendance and chronic absenteeism data, but what do you do with it? Um, and so we have a deliberative uh, 40X uh, model of goal setting, um, sort of like the leader in me goal setting, where it encourages principals and students to go through the same system of goal setting using the same data to improve and scoreboarding our progress. Sort of like what Marcy Ronald says, you, how do you know if you're uh, succeeding unless you're keeping score? So we have a common system of setting goals and keeping score with our uh, district level data systems. We are trying to communicate a little bit better with parents. Uh, you're gonna see some marginally entertaining um, uh, uh, media from the Bethlehem Area School District with me being the first uh, person expressing the importance of uh, regular school attendance uh, to parents and other stakeholders. It's going to be called, did you know? Um, and it clears up some of the mistaken information that we've given over the years that might be pandemic related that are actually contributing to weaker attendance. <laughs> Our interventions and accountability resources, you know, we, we need to intervene in attendance like we intervene when a student isn't reading at grade level. And what does that mean? Safe plan, what does that individualized plan for student look like? Or are we trying to improve all students with the same strategies? We're finding that that isn't any more effective than improving academic uh, outcomes with general strategies that aren't personalized to, to the student. <clears throat> so that attendance intervention and accountability committee is really at it uh, and really involving uh, the, all the local partnerships, including the United Way. In Bethlehem, uh, we, uh, uh, tr about half of our kids, a little less than half of our kids take a bus to school, but we have found and Dr. Leeson and the uh, assessment committee, the um, student attendance committee have really analyzed the maps and looked at, you know, there are some kids, little kids walking pretty far to school. And there are some other kids who are like, get a bus, but really don't need one. And some of those happen to be in areas where students have greater degrees of poverty. So how are our transportation policies contributing or not contributing to student attendance and what can we do to adjust them? Um, we have a lot of examples on that and how do we adjust it so that transportation could be seen as a strategy rather than an impediment for students coming to school. And then finally, health services. This is a page right out of the community school playbook. You know, kids, you know, we want them in school and we want them to be healthy. Uh, so they have to have those health related resources while they're here uh, as not only just a, a pull them into school, but keep them while they're here. And so we're we're working with our school nurses, nurses, our urgent cares, our hospitals uh, to make the common communication, but also have sort of a seamless system of health supports for students with a common message of attendance. So those are, and, and I'm not saying we have registered great success. Many of these uh, strategies are in the development phase. And I think district leaders are trying to find the way of being like air traffic controllers and making sure all these strategies stay together and work together in a common approach. But uh, so far, uh, so good in terms of uh, how we're doing in the Bethlehem Area School District. We're collecting monthly average daily attendance. And as you heard, that's not the best measure, but we're working very closely on individual cases of chronic absenteeism. So um, we're uh, definitely a work in progress, uh, well, a lot here. And But I do want to thank Attendance Works. And I also want to thank EAB, uh, which has done a lot of data informed work that our attendance committee and the subcommittees have been using uh, to help inform their work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Silva, for that overview of what's working in your school district, right? And um, you very beautifully captured some of the pieces that some of our other panelists will dive deeper into of what some of those practices look like at the school site level, 
Right. So I'll actually ask Pr Principal Bodner you the next question. Um, as you're in Allentown School District, neighboring Bethlehem Area School District, um, can you share is chronic absence also a challenge at Central or ASD and and what has that looked like over the past few years? Sure. Are you able to pull up my slides? Mm -hmm. Yep. So very similar to some of the stories that Dr. Silva had shared, um, we absolutely struggle with chronic absenteeism. Coming back from COVID, we were at 69% of our students were chronically absent, um, which is just not beneficial for anyone. So we really had to think outside the box and kind of what we've heard some people talk about earlier today, not just looking at the punitive and you know having the seeps, but really asking ourselves and asking the parents, how can we help? How can we help you? How can we help get our, our students, your children to school? So we had to think differently and approach it in a way to um, gather a lot of information, have a lot of conversations with both the parents and students. What would you like to see in school? What are some services that we can help out with? Um, Today, we had the Vision Van kickoff, so that uh, allows all of our students to have access to free glasses. So all of our staff in our building also wore their glasses today just to encourage all the kids to, um, you know, get get their eyes checked and, and absolutely uh, take, take, um, take full advantage of that free resource. So after COVID, we just had a very hard time engaging our students again, engaging our community. It did take us a lot of work, a lot of phone calls, um, but by all means, again, it is a team approach. So I have um, outreach workers, we have attendance meetings weekly, taking a look and not just taking a look at the percentages, but taking a look at the students as individuals and finding out what it is that they needed, how could we help them, what supports could we put in place um, to get them back in school and get them interested to be in school. It's not just about them getting them to school, but what can we do to make their day exciting and fun? Uh, we pulled the students to see what kinds of activities and clubs they wanted to be involved in. Um, I had no idea, but cheering is a huge thing. We have 96 cheerleaders in kindergarten through fifth grade this year. So just finding all of those different um, activities and events that they want to be involved in and offering it here at the school so that they have something to look forward to. Um, throughout the year, you know, we definitely are, are posting to our parents why it's important. We use a lot of the resources from Attendance Works, and that's how we kicked off our school year, school year this year, but just making sure that they were aware of what that really means and what impact it has if their children are missing too many days of school. Um, so just trying to um, get us as a building to a better place, but building those relationships and really strengthening those connections with the families. Um, from even just the start of the day, making sure that all of our staff that's able to is outside and at every entry door to say good morning to the kids, say good morning to the parents, hey, have a great day, mom, we'll see you in a few hours. Um, so coming back from COVID, we were at 69% of our students were considered chronically absent. The following year, we had a huge decrease. We got it down to 46%, but still, again, that is a, an incredibly high number. So we are continuing our work and just always trying to um, find out what it is that we can do to help our parents and, and to help our students uh, get to school. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Bodner. And I, I, I'd like to ask you a follow-up question, which you touched on a little bit, is that positive communication and building relationships with parents and families in addressing chronic absenteeism. Um, can you, so you touched on it a little bit. Can you expand on that a little? Sure, can you go to the next slide? So we spent some time uh, interviewing and talking to parents and then talking to the students separately to find out what it was that they were looking for at school. Yes, we know school is a place that they come to to be educated, but we're trying to um, develop the child as a whole. So what is it that gets them excited? Um, so again, you know, starting every day, every morning with everyone that's not a homeroom teacher outside saying good morning to our kids, saying good morning to our families making sure that the parents had the tools and the resources that they knew. We all know that if you're not keeping track of how many times your child's absent, it can get out of hand and snowball very quickly. So we started the year making sure that they had the attendance chart so that they could keep track of how often their child was absent. 
we made sure that they had access to all the resources from attendance works, what those impacts would be, um, and really increased and beefed up all of our um, parent and our student after school activities. So finding out what the parents wanted to be involved in, what the students wanted to be involved in. And then it's not, it's not just one thing that you implement and put into place, it's an ongoing process. Consistently looking at that data and looking to see which children are struggling to get to school. And there's always different reasons. So you can't blanket and, and treat every child the same. You have to dig down and find out what the root cause is and, and what's the barrier keeping them from coming to school. So if we notice that there's a, a child um, absent a few days, teachers have access to miss you postcards. We get them out. Um, our outreach worker does lunch bunches here in the building. Um, and then we kind of um, stumbled upon and, and realized last year when it was PSSA time, just by us posting on Class Dojo, we need 100% of students in school every single day for the month of testing. And they all showed up. So that rolled into this idea of our attendance ambassador, where we really solicited the help of um, all of the community organizations each month has an attendance ambassador. They're a person that comes in, they'll post a video, um, or come to the school, just say good morning, give high fives to kids. Sometimes they have incentives and prizes that we can use. And through that work, we are able to keep our daily attendance at or above 90% every month this school year so far. So it has had a huge impact for the kids to see that the whole entire community is invested in them and really wants to see them doing well here at school. Um, City Center came down right before Christmas break and handed out just a small candy cane and a high five and the kids were elated that they got a candy cane in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. So again, this is just continuous work. We meet every week to see what's going on with our students and with our parents. Um, and then we're constantly reconnecting with the parents through Class Dojo. We're showing them what the weekly attendance is by grade level um, to incentivize them. It's so much so now when we're posting a competition, if we have a weekly perfect attendance um, competition, I had a mom tell me that their daughter drug them to school, made them get up and bring them to school because they didn't want to be eliminated um, from the competition for perfect attendance for the week. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Principal Bodner. And, and again, kind of going back to what um, Cecilia Leong, our, our national expert, shared with us, it, you're not only speaking to some of those mindset pieces as a principal, as a leader in your building, but also speaking to eventually those strategies and what that implementation looks like in your building to create what the 23% decrease in your chronic absence in one year is a huge feat. And again, it can't be done alone, but there's some incredible pieces that you shared here. Um, and just to everyone in, in the audience that's listening, if you're more interested in digging deeper with Principal Bodner, we'll share her slides and some of the interventions that she referred to um, at the end, at the end of the, the webinar too. Um, we've heard a little bit about multi-tier systems of support or strategies from Dr. Silva um, and Cecilia um, in some of the conversation. And I know Ramos Elementary, uh, Danielle Day, you have helped create the logic model of the MTSS system at your school. And are you able to share some of how that MTSS system helps address barriers to learning, um, specifically attendance in in your school. So, did you want to show the um, show the mm -hmm. chart for us? Great. So, um, last year the MTSS team wanted to um, really streamline this process, and our goals were to be more data driven, um, equitable and have it easily accessible to teachers. Um, we know that, that these components, if you're looking at the chart at the top, I know there's, there's a lot going on here, but we're just gonna focus on mostly at the top here. We know that attendance, SEL behavior, and academics go pretty much hand in hand. They overlap. We see that a lot. So we wanted to make sure that, that we, we took a team approach to how we would handle this. Um, so we have an attendance team that is our assistant principal, principal, um, guidance counselor. We have a homeschool visitor, part of that, our outreach worker. 
And that team is meeting bi-monthly, um, reporting to us as well. And they are, you know, coming up with, um, they're report reporting back with who are the chronically absent students in our schools that we need to address. Who are those students that we need to identify and make sure that they are receiving a tier two, tier three intervention. So some tier two interventions that we are implementing are, um, you know, our guidance counselors are seeing attendance groups and they're, they're uh, presenting lessons on the importance of attending school and how that correlates to when you're older and you have a job and you need to, you know, show up for work and really bring ownership to our kids into how important it is to attend school and then incentivizing it um, with the kids. Um, some tier three interventions for attendance would be, we have our uh, social workers, we work with two groups, outside agencies, um, and they will meet with parents, meet with families um, to see what barriers are there that we need to overcome. How can we help you? What can we do to get your child to school to, you know, to, to make it easier for you or to implement things different, um, implement different actions I've had a social worker where the plan was she would bring the student to school every day. I mean, so they're very good with working with families in the home to overcome these barriers. Um, the other two pieces that you're looking at would be the SEL behavior and the academics. And generally, when you see a student missing so much school, you're going to see, um, you know, issues with, with, with academics. You're going to see um, issues with behavior. Um, so the care team is what handles that, those two domains and the care team meets weekly. Um, and we have become a very data driven team where we, we have created spreadsheets. We want to make sure that we are, um, identifying students that are in need, um, of additional support. And we do that through tracking our students through their formative assessments, um, through their learning platforms. All of these, these uh, data points are recorded on our data spreadsheets. Um, and our goal as a school is one year's growth. So we do have a column that shows growth. Um, all of our teachers have access to these spreadsheets. Um, and we can, you know, kind of zero in on, okay, what students are not making that growth? Is it attendance? Is it, you know, they're struggling with the tier one content. They need more, they need an addition, they need more support, a new, more supportive um, intervention. They need a tier two. Um, are there teachers referring them for behavior uh, disciplinary action? Um, also, we like to have the input of the teachers and the parents at our meetings. So we invite families into our meetings every week. Um, we send out packets to the teachers so that they can record um, their observational data of their student because the teacher knows their student best, knows any changes at home with the family, with the student that they can report on. We also involve our health services. The nurse is so important. Um, she's a part of our team. Are there any 504s, you know, medical diagnoses, anything like that we need to take into consideration? So our goal is to look at the child as a whole and all of these pieces, all these components, they fit together so that we can best meet the needs of our kids. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and this is incredible, right? Like seeing um, Cecilia say, like, you need a whole team to, to make this work and impact happen and seeing it in action in Allentown um, in one of our newer community schools is incredible. So thank you for sharing that. Um, can you speak to a little bit of how some of that data is tracked? Um, in the MTSS process. So you said that there's spreadsheets that are tracking the academic and SEL pieces. Um, and how does that connect to attendance and your attendance meetings? So the attendance at the attendance meeting, they are printing out a report bi-monthly from our student 
data st uh, system, which is Sapphire. Um, and it is showing us those students that are chronically uh, chronically absent. Um, those, those students are given to us as well when we have our care team meetings so that we can sort of cross track, track. Okay, I have a chronically absent student here. Let's pull up our data sheet. Let's see you know, how they're performing. Is this affecting their achievement? Is their attendance affecting their achievement? Um, and then from there, we can make more than just an academic goal. So then from there, we're also making our um, attendance goals as well. Amazing. So it all it all seems to interconnect and, and you're you're even though you're two separate teams, it seems like you guys have some good um, communication happening on that weekly basis. Correct. Um, and, and how has the MTSS logic model impacted your school and student achievement at Ramos then? So I think what we're, we're most proud about is becoming a very data-driven school. I think, um, you know, we really try to get our teachers away from saying like, I feel or I think. That's an important piece, observational data. But also, okay, what are what what factually, what data do you have? What what is the data showing? What skill sets are your students lacking in? What exactly do they need? Um, so that we can really target what interventions will best help this student, help support this student. So becoming more data data driven and um, really. Um, becoming more of a team that is inclusive, like I said, of teachers, support staff, nurses, um, you know, administrators, school psychologists, reading specialists, early interventionists, myself, the intervention specialist, um, as well, most importantly, families. And that is our goal to, to at our meetings, always bring the family members in and be very, um, you know, be very approachable to them and um, try to come up with ideas, plans, and goals together as a team with our families included in that team. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for uh, entertaining some of my questions and diving deeper into that MTSS logic model with us today. Um, couples. You are sitting close to Allentown in Bethlehem in Eastern Area School District. Um, can you speak to what that chronic absence landscape looks like in your school? Yes, thank you. Um, while you're pulling up the, the, the slides there, I'll just kind of, um, you know, just give a little background. I'm not new to the district, but new to Paxinosa Elementary School. Uh, so coming into July, I had a, a lot I had to figure out and um, uh, with the needs of the school and how the school functioned. Um, but right right away, um, in meeting with Janine Santaloas, our our uh, CIS coordinator here at the school, um, the the attendance concern was was brought to uh, my attention. Uh, so when her and I got together and we talked about you know setting some goals for the year and how uh, communities and schools could assist uh, with that. This this uh, right away um, was obvious that this is where we needed to start. Um, so it was apparent. <clears throat> um, so as soon as I saw this data um, from last year, it was eye opening, um, and it was easily um, again a topic that we know that we need to start addressing uh, right off the bat. Um, so as you can see there, um, you know our data from last year and our, our students by grade level that were um, considered chronically absent. Um, you know, really concerning the, the numbers there at 49% for our kindergarten. Um, so that, that is huge and it's huge across the board. Um, so, you know, we wanted to make sure that, um, we put a plan in place right off the bat of what we would do to, to work on this. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we were uh, discussing it from a school-wide, uh, from a grade level perspective, as you see these grade level numbers, and then also from a student individual perspective. Um, so we wanted to make sure we are we are touching all, on all three of those uh, layers and all three of those uh, parts. Um, you know, we will say that um, as we moved along, um, fortunately, 
with uh, our partnerships, we were able to get uh, AmeriCorps uh, a Vista staff member in the building um, who was really able to help us look at students from an, an ind individual perspective um, and meet with students individually and see what those individual students' needs were. Um, so one of the things that that staff member did assist us with is these grade level lunch groups. Um, as, as, a, as a team, um, with that staff member, myself, Janine, and our counselors, we were able to flag some students that, uh, you know, were reaching that chronic absenteeism and get the support um, from that staff member. And, and she began to meet with students um, individually in small groups. Um, they really wanted to see the reasons behind being absent. Um, one of the things that we really talked about was as we're, you know, our fourth graders or fifth graders, and as they get older, they really can become responsible um, you know, to, to, to work on getting themselves here to school, especially those that walk. Um, so one of the things we realized is we got to put a plan in place for these students uh, to learn, learn how to build routines in the morning. Um, what do I need to do? What time do I have to get up? What time do I have to have A, B, and C done in order to walk to school on time and get here? So they're really focused on um, creating routine boards in order to help with those daily routines that we all need to, to work on. Uh, so they created these routine boards, they utilized them at home, um, and just built upon uh, getting to, to school here on a daily basis. And um, as I'll mention later on, we had a group of those students who went from, you know, hitting that chronic absenteeism to actually then the next month being here to school every day for the month. Um, so little things like that actually, you know, showed the success of that, that program and those discussions. Um, Another big thing that she was able to assist with um, was just surveying those students that she had. You know, what are the reasons that maybe you struggled to get to school here on time? And then focusing on those individual reasons with those individual students. Um, as beautiful. you see, I'm sorry. No, beautiful. I, I, I was gonna jump to the slide that shows some of that impact, if that's okay. So Maddie, can you go to the last slide? of that deck just so we can connect it yep so here we're just looking at um you know we're tracking our perfect attendance uh for students throughout the month as the month moves on um a little comparison from last year 2022 to 2023 um, looking at it monthly um so again students attending uh school every day for the month um october november december and january so as you move along you can see we're, we're reaching about 100 students more this year attending school monthly um, as of right now, you know, getting ready to pull our February numbers soon. Um, one of the things that we do, along with uh, Janine Santalois again and, and, and CIS, is make sure these students are recognized. I mean, you know, they, they come in the morning, they have a, a hot breakfast. I mean, they're, they're, eating, they're eating like kings when they come here uh, to receive their, um, their monthly reward for coming to school you know, every month and um, coming from a secondary level at the middle school, one of the things I learned quickly is that a certificate goes a long way with these kiddos. Uh, they are, they are um, you know, love the fact that they are recognized in the littlest ways and then also just receiving a, just a fabulous yeah. breakfast um, and having a second, a, a separate recognition for these students uh, for attending school for the entire month. That's amazing. Um, and it's incredible to see the, the different tiers of support that you have in place at PACS, not only school-wide supports that are foundational and, and impacting your whole school, but also that tiered level um, that are recognizing and working with inter individuals that might be at risk for chronic absence and that improvement that you're seeing with those students being perfect attendance awards um, monthly, right? Um, so thank you for for all to all of our panelists for sharing some of what's working in your school district in your school um, and I want to slide it back to Jill uh, I know we have a couple questions to ask all five of our panelists now um, so Jill yeah great thanks Kushbu and thanks uh, Jack and Becky and Danielle and John, and of course, back to Cecilia, this, we could go for another couple of hours on just continuing to unpack the challenge and also the solutions that are being lifted up. Um, what's sticking in mind is it's a solvable problem and there's no silver bullet. And you all have demonstrated both pieces of that 
um, balance throughout your presentation. So, um, Cecilia, first question for you. Um, are there any information, student information systems out there that seem to be easy at data extraction or reporting on chronic absenteeism? What have you seen that has some ease of use? Okay, I'm happy to answer that. I'm not endorsing products. I am i don't get sales commissions or anything like that. Um, I, I'm seeing more and more student information systems providing um, chronic absence data and reports. Um, the big ones like PowerSchool uh, have created more um, user-friendly experiences. Um, Aries here in California is huge. I don't know if you have it out there. Any student information system can be pulled that you can pull the data and create the reports. How easy it is, is a different thing. I've seen Panorama do really cool stuff um, with both attendance and behavior and SEL data. And, and they have the additional um, ability to uh, track and assign and monitor interventions. So that's a nice system as well. Happy to have others chime in about what works for you because I heard some of that uh, from the other presenters as well. Yeah, thanks, Cecilia. Um, Jack, Becky, uh, John, Danielle, is there a breakthrough that you've had with the SIS systems that you're using on an ease of use with chronic absence data that you could lift up very quickly? I, I mean, from my perspective, the only thing I really reached out to is, uh, you know, the person in my district who who knows the ins and outs of of our power school and, and how to pull that data. And I, I just reached out to her asking for the data that we need. And, um, and now it's set up that I'm getting those reports, you know, weekly and monthly. Um, and that's really what I utilize to track that data at the end of the month when it comes to our school-wide uh, competitions and rewards and, um, and even our classroom-wide. So um, I just go to, go to those who know how to use it and they'll get you the answers. Thanks, John. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears here a bit. Um, there's a question in here around um, celebration of culture and family. So uh, maybe Becky, we'll start with you. Um, what have you seen or how have you seen celebration of culture and families boost everyday attendance? So uh, we, we definitely acknowledge that we have many different cultures here. Um, at Central uh, and trying to always find different ways to bring that into the classroom. The more we get the parents into the building, into the classrooms and really feel a uh, part of them um, and, and truly connected to the school, it absolutely helps us um, just bridge that gap between, um, you know, the parents not feeling a true part of the building. Thanks, Becky. Other perspectives on that? Well, there's, there's the gen there's the general feeling of of people from different cultures and backgrounds feeling welcome in school. And that's just a, a general tenor you want to have for school success. And then there's the specific strategies for students, usually of poverty and of color, who are facing extraordinary circumstances like what we were talking about in our transportation or access to health care or uh, other things that uh, have have to be addressed in an equitable way. And I think you have to guard against thinking that one strategy is gonna work across the board with everybody. And unless you're really committed to removing some of the barriers that, that children of poverty and children of color are facing uniquely, you're not gonna make any real progress on the overall number. Thanks, Jack. Uh, we're short on time. I'm gonna end uh, with a final question here for all folks, all of the panelists. Um, and I know that there's a lot of, of educational leaders on the call today. There's also a good complement of community partners. And so this question is, what and how can community partners support school districts efforts to reduce chronic absenteeism? So you have a captive audience of people that are really interested in this topic. Um, what are some of the best ways that partners can kind of walk alongside a school district in supporting reducing chronic absenteeism? I think for us, um, just having the partners come into the building and show all of our students that you genuinely, genuinely care about them, their well-being, but well-being and their success. Um, the more that they see a variety of different partners and people in here, it really does show them that everyone is here to lift them up. So just be a part of the school, whether that's um, with time, energy, or or things that you can do to to help the school. Thanks, Becky. 
I would just add, I really love Dr. Silva's example of having the uh, primary care physicians as part of that network. And it's all about aligned contributions. What can we each contribute and bring um, to the solutions and to the support? And community partners often are closer to the families mm -hmm. that we struggle to reach when we're inside the school building. And so mm -hmm. I think anything you can do um, to create those partnerships and pull up a seat at the table for the community partners, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. I, I see friends from other school districts that couldn't necessarily be a community school because of their uh, their 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 children and their families don't hit the high enough number of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. But they can still use a page out of the community school playbook by establishing an important partnership with an organization. Maybe not the full network of them and the coordination of them, but with a St. Luke's or with someone else in that that they would have access in their district and work together on a common measure. I, I think that's what we do with schools in our district that are not community schools, but still need uh, connections to community resources. Thanks, Jack. Well, we're going to have to end our conversation today there. I want to give a huge thank you again to Cecilia Leong from Attendance Works for sharing your, your knowledge with us today and also to all of our presenters on the panel and for everybody else for participating. Uh, we'll be sending out a recap. I think this is the beginning next step of a conversation. Certainly want to hear if there's an appetite for more convening around chronic absenteeism around the region. So keep your eyes open for a recap. Cap. We'll send out the resources that were shared today with a bit of a survey on what might come next. So from LV Reads to all of you, pledge your minutes for the Million Minute Challenge, and uh, we will see you around the bend real soon. Thank you.